hello everybody. I'm Andrea Mocci. And uh, as uh, Luca said, I work at Code Lounge, um, which is essentially a um, um, group that uh, whose focus is to do research and development. So if you obviously inside the Software Institute. So if you look at Code Launch website, and I'm going to do a couple of switches to uh, to the browser just because uh, I have a couple of visualizations later to show you. But I want to start uh, just to talk a little about Code Launch. So what we do, we kind of combine experiences from academia and industry, and we do research and development. So typically. Uh, what we try to do is either to collaborate with research groups to take a prototype and make it like uh, in a more of production form, or we do uh, other forms or applied uh, research in areas of software development, visualization, evolution, and stuff. And stuff. So, as a team, as, there is, you know, Code Lounge is headed by Marco Damulus and Michele Lanza. I'm the most senior uh, behind them, if you want. So. Uh, typically, what I do as a junior group leader is, is a kind of lead, uh, you know, the initiatives uh, that are a little more technical inside Code Launch. I have uh, had a couple of research projects that I led or that I co-led, and so I mainly collaborate with the other developers in order to define our culture together with the leads, obviously. So today we're going to talk about exactly the culture of Code Launch. And if you read the, uh, the vision that it's on the website, there are a lot of stuff uh, that are quite interesting and that I will pick up uh, slightly later, like uh, a focus on the substance and like avoiding micromanaging and taking sensible decisions or revisiting our own decision. In particular, this one, revisit, 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 is kind of the story uh, that I will try to tell you that they will be clear at the end and I will try to tell you. So the idea is that uh, our processes in general and the way we develop are not fixed, we're sort of uh, continuously evolving. And this is the story of that today. So these are visions. So I'm going to go a little more technical if you want uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. And uh, initially, I wanted to focus both on technology and process. But unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time. So 20 minutes or 25, they are not really enough. So I will focus today only, unfortunately, on the process we follow um, uh, inside Code Lounge and the way we define our culture, our development culture from that point of view. So uh, what's process, uh, what's development process, and what's the life cycle? Here's a simple definition. Um, so it's the way you organize all activities related to, to software production, how you define the goals uh, and how do you define the expected outputs. But this is a very general definition. So uh, if you attended Michele's uh, um, seminar uh, probably two weeks ago, if I'm not wrong, so you know that uh, you've seen, for example, one of the development lifecycle models, which was waterfall, but nowadays, uh, there have been a lot of uh, history from then to now. Let's say that still the most common approaches that are applied, so-called agile uh, uh, methodologies. And uh, this is like a mini extract that you should know about uh, the agile manifesto that uh, pretty much identified what the manifesto values over something else. So value, for example, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change, okay? So these three are particularly important. And uh, so uh, if you uh, look at real methodologies that are based on these, on these, uh, on these uh, uh, principles, there are many. Uh, one that was actually born before um, Agile, it's extreme programming that you should know. And I don't want to do a lecture on extreme programming. That would be too long. What I want to uh, just focus here is on two little aspects of this process, which is this iteration, iteration here, and the fact of having small releases. So the idea is that you should build software under small iteration, so with a process that uh, support, is supported by small iteration and frequently produce working software. This is just one, obviously, of the characteristic of extreme programming. There are others uh, that I will mention again later that are particularly important for the way 
code launch works from the development point. There's another one rather than extreme programming that you should also probably heard of, which is Scrum. This is a, a quite a nice uh, diagram about uh, Scrum. Uh, there are a couple of uh, things that are applied and the artifacts that are, uh, for example, uh, used into Scrum, like the product backlog, which is a list essentially of uh, features, if you want, that needs to be implemented um, uh, to release a particular product, and then like backlogs, so a list of these things under a particular sprint. And the sprint is just the name for a particular iteration mm, in the world of Scrum. Now, if you attend uh, your uh, lectures on software development and software engineering at the university, probably you have already seen that. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, not everybody is happy on uh, how, uh, let's say, the agile methodologies are actually, um, are actually uh, um, constructed from most, most of the other points of view that are actually uh, implied by these uh, methodologies. And I want to just give you the opinion of an academic here. Um, and I'm pretty sure that most of you do Scrum or Agile at work. Um, and I think Agile is a cancer that we have to eliminate from the industry. <laughs> okay. So if you go to Wikipedia, which is the source of all my knowledge, and you search for, for Scrum, Oh, holy smokes, you find all kind of good things. It's flexible, it's holistic, it challenges the traditional approach. You can self-organize. Wow, doesn't that make you feel powerful? I can self-organize. What the fuck, the manager, should, you know, they should get kind of out of here, okay? And uh, all kind of goodness. The problem is that Scrum is all buzzwords. Okay, it's talking about code, except writing code. Now, many of you, I'm pretty sure, uh, since you're doing agile at work, have suffered to stand-up meetings. And I'm pretty sure that you've been kind of thinking about this, you know, who the fuck, why, when did they last check in code? Oh yes, oh man, I have a hangover yesterday, stop this crap, I, I just need to go behind my screen, I want to watch cat videos, okay? Every stand-up that you do is, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that is seven people times ten minutes, that's one hour less to write code, okay? So stand-ups are, I think, the worst thing ever the worst thing ever. So this, by the way, is Eric Mayer. He's a developer and also an academic. So this is quite interesting. It's uh, so it's quite a color, quite a colorful language. I want to just give another little piece just to tell you that some of the practices inside the Gile are a little contested nowadays. Connecting ourselves to this nonsense. All right. Then here is the worst thing about Agile. We're being fucked. You're being fucked. You're being fucked. You're being fucked. Okay? Because one of the kind of you know, fundaments of agile is so-called subtle control. Okay? So you are not a self-organizing team. The freaking managers are still in charge. Only they do it with subtle control. Okay? They're not telling you what to do. They're doing it subtly. So you're like sheep. Okay? Now if you search for subtle control, this is like abuse, okay? So we are being abused by our managers. And these managers love it because we think, oh, we're self-organizing. But in the meantime, we're all being fucked. Okay. So, what, 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 why, why does this work? Well, because Agile is a pure pyramid scheme. So you can start with certified Scrum developer, tester. Who here, you know, how can you have a career as a tester? Oh, but if I'm an agile tester, suddenly, you know, my career is going in, in uh, warp speed. This is all a big pyramid scheme. And we're playing the game. Okay? And Jeff Sutherland is our Jesus. 
Now it's time to view him as our Satan. So, if there's one thing that you take home from this talk, is that we should end Scrum and Agile. We are developers. We write code. We don't talk about code. We write code. And if you want to know more, so that so if you want to know more, actually, so this vision is like extreme. It's not something that I uh, personally at Insight Code Launch we uh, obviously agree completely. It was just an introduction to actually the content of this book, which is a book from Bertram Mayer, where he investigated completely the world of agile, uh, extracting and synthesizing, if you want, the good, the hype, and the ugly. So there is actually a lot of uh, bad things, like the one that were mentioned, but there's also a lot of good things. And I want to mention a couple that are actually considered brilliant by Bertram Mayer. This is one of the books that if you like software development, you should definitely read, by the way. And it's the brilliant one. And in, uh, the brilliant part of Agile uh, includes many things, but the things that I consider most important are like short iterations and the idea of doing continuous integration and uh, then ideas like the regression test suite artifacts. Okay, So the short iteration, I already mentioned them if you want. So the idea of an iteration, so these uh, periods where you uh, start focusing on developing software, um, uh, and a certain feature related to software, and uh, you you do those um, um, by producing frequently uh, um, working uh, prototypes and releases. Okay, but uh, I will mention those again. These are the brilliant part. And the idea nowadays is that when you want to construct a culture of software development for the issues that you have with all these methodologies. What you do is essentially you build your own agile. You try to pick the methodologies and the techniques that you think most match your ideas of building software, and you try to uh, uh, to synthesize them in order to create your own culture, if you want. And this is pretty much what, what we did. So one of the most important, uh, and that I will tell you in this talk. So one of the most important things uh, that uh, we decided to have inside Code Lounge is to um, uh, support uh, our development culture and our process into an integrated uh, um, integrated system, so uh, an integrated collaborative platform. What we use is GitLab, which is essentially uh, something that supports the entire software development lifecycle. And the story here is uh, in practice on the process on how we use this. Okay. So, and what are the characteristics of Agile methodologies that are supported by GitLab that we peruse and uh, with a little data that uh, shows it. So, uh, what, we, uh, what you can do with GitLab is pretty much support uh, uh, aspects of software development that are related first to repository management. So like, for example, version control, but uh, this is like uh, the minimal aspect. It's not just a web interface that you have inside uh, inside Git, okay? So I wouldn't really consider GitLab like something like on Git on steroids, because what we what it actually supports is the entire um, development process, in particular from uh, um, planning and iterations and collaboration, which is extremely important, and then we'll see. CICD, so continuous integration and continuous de de deployment. So uh, I'll focus on these three just because obviously a lecture on or something like, uh, uh, like a focus on Git would be probably not a lot of interesting. And uh, first of all, I want to show you um, a little list of activities or things that happened during the history of Code Lounge. So these are all the events uh, and the intensity of the events from 2019. Actually, Code Lounge is a little older, from 2019, and it just shows uh, periods of intensity where we did uh, a lot of work. So these moments, uh, for example, include um, uh, projects like uh, uh, TACO that you heard about. Here, a lot of stuff is happening, and uh, these events are pretty much uh, both uh, events on the repository, so like pushes and commits and collaborative stuff. So there's a lot of things happening. 
uh, also in days uh, that uh, we shouldn't be working. But anyway, you see a couple of, uh, one of the interesting things is that you see a little more intense uh, start of working during the pandemic last year, which I find it kind of interesting. So uh, I'll go back to this visualization later with a slightly different flavor. So this is another uh, thing that characterizes us. So here are uh, the uh, essentially the events generated by the developers. And as you can see, pretty much with the people we are, we are around six here. There are the first like top four in the end during the whole history. And you can see that the one related to uh, mayor um, commits are actually one like around 50 percent. OK, the other ones are all related to planning. And if you want to things like code reviewing, like these comments and the amount to pretty much 50 percent of our work. So this is uh, kind of interesting, at least for me, when I first see it, this data. But this is kind of simple data. These are just events. By the way, this one is, is interesting, and I'll talk that just comments. So this user is uh, particularly interesting from this point of view. So let's start from planning and iterations. And uh, so GitLab does uh, something. So it essentially uses, um, um, like provides dedicated facilities uh, to support things like uh, um, product backlog items or user stories, uh, the things that essentially are the core of the things that you should develop during the Microsoft pro project. And uh, these are implemented, it can be used uh, for example, through GitLab is issues. So you can use issues in GitLab in order to model user stories that you have to implement or product backlog items like in Scrum that you need to implement as a team. Uh, sprint and iteration, so this series of uh, uh, development of a set of user stories or a product backlog items, depending on the approach, can be modeled with milestones, another GitLab uh, ish, uh, feature. And then, uh, obviously, the backlog for a particular um, sprint or uh, iteration can be uh, seen either with the uh, issue list or the board, uh, for example, linked to a particular milestone, which represents the iteration. The iteration. So um, the board for the issues that essentially models uh, uh, like uh, what the team does under a certain period of time is uh, what we use uh, to support planning hmm, and to track what we do. Here you can see, for example, that there are a couple of issues uh, in this particular project, like four that are actually being uh, done, like scheduled to be done. There is nothing under review, but uh, we also have this status for these issues that uh, can be under review, and some of them are closed, so essentially implemented. Mm? And uh, a real backlog is also in the to-do list. Mm? So this uh, functionality helps us planning. Mm? Now, if you uh, look at the history of our planning, so this is uh, a bar chart starting from uh, 1st of January 2019. And uh, if I extend it now, you see, well, let's ignore this because it's, uh, it's not that interesting. But the one that are new and then closed uh, kind of have cycles, if you can see. So these moments where you see a lot of issues being open are moments of planning. And when you see all of these closed are essentially moments where we uh, have implemented a lot of stuff and all these issues corresponding to the feature are being closed. There are moments uh, that are strange that they have to inspect actually because they are interesting like this one. There are 35 open, which, are kind of, which is a kind of outlier uh, in July 2020. I have no idea what happened there, but uh, this is kind of interesting. So this is like a sort of uh, periodic cycles in what happens in planning and then implementing. So we are not following iterations with specific durations. So this is a sort of uh, not really regular, but it's interesting to see that you can see moments where we plan a lot 
and other moments where the things are actually solved and implemented. Okay, so this is for uh, for the pro for uh, the whole uh, GitLab. So for all of our project, this is that for a specific project, and you can see the history that in this project in particular there is one entire uh, there is a first phase where there's like a bootstrap and implementation. There is a sort of uh, uh, pause when nothing happened, and then uh, we resumed uh, some implementation stuff, some kind of uh, a lot of issues and bugs to solve and uh, a little maintenance and perfection that has been done in the beginning of 2021. So what you can see here is, is again, planning and resolution and so on. Now, uh, issues are not the only thing that, uh, that you can do with, uh, with, uh, with GitLab. What you can do is also uh, pretty much uh, um, constructing um, um, the way, so supporting the way you uh, you collaborate by writing code together. And uh, when we start working on an issue, what we do is we essentially create a merge request, which is a request to merge one branch into another. And uh, what happens here is that uh, um, it will give you a dedicated branch in the repository on which the developers alone or, a, or in collaboration can, for example, work on that particular issue. So if you can see the list of merge requests that have been uh, uh, new, so that correspond when people start working on something and merged. So when, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the code has been approved and uh, moved to the main branch, um, and moved to the main branch. So what I want to show you be, rather than this is the same thing, but for the project that I showed you before. So it's kind of similar, but as you can see, there are a lot of uh, these green moments here are moments where the merge requests are open. So correspond when we are actively working on a given feature. And you can see it a little more clearly what happens. Mm, a little more, not, not that much because this is like uh, just a bar chart, but this is a little more, more interesting. This spike, these are all issues uh, that have been a merge request that have been done in a single day and solved in a single day. Probably things that were extremely urgent, okay? But uh, that's it. So um, this is all for planning and iteration. I want to move into actually the time is a little rushed, but I want to just show you now uh, per programming and code review because it, this is like uh, uh, where uh, GitLab supports us the most, pretty much. So when we start working on, 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 on an issue, we open a merge request. So, and when we open a merge request, uh, the idea is that ideally we work in pairs. We have one developer that does uh, uh, the driver, so the, that writes the code, and the other one that does navigation. So kind of continuously reviews the code during programming. And this is a typical practice of per programming. So what happens is that in the, in the feature branch now, you have uh, uh, commits that are mixed between the two, because the, the, the two uh, roles of per programming should frequently switch. And that's uh, what typically happens. In this case, we are kind of confident most of the times that uh, we have enough shared knowledge on what has been implemented. And uh, if, it's if it's not possible, uh, typically, uh, we, allow, um, we allow a direct uh, approval of the merge request because there are two people that share the knowledge on this feature. And this goes directly into the main branch, in this case, in the development and then in the main branch. But what happens if, uh, for example, we don't have this situation? Sometimes uh, we don't have the possibility, for example, to assign two developers to work on a given, on a given uh, branch. What happens is that uh, we apply another uh, uh, methodology that has been uh, uh, kind of suggested into, into practice and it's part of our culture, which is code review. Here you can see in which sense uh, GitLab supports code review. You can, for example, comment. You can, for, for, for beginning, start assigning a reviewer to a particular uh, um, uh, merge request that contains all the changes that correspond to the feature. 
And as you can see here, um, there are my comments and then there are replies and this whole discussion is all a set of uh, replies and, uh, and uh, discussion between me and the author of this particular merge request. So what happens is that after uh, I leave my comments, typically, or the reviewer leaves the comments, you have changes related to code review. And you have, uh, at the end, the merge re review, uh, sorry, the merge request approve the merge when there are all these changes. So what you have seen here are two different ways of collaborating that in GitLab uh, have a significantly different shape. In the first case, there are two developers that uh, push on the same feature branch. And so you're going to see that, uh, that they collaborated directly by uh, pushing code in the same branch, so in the same uh, 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 branch of the code base. Okay? In the second case, it's something that uh, instead uh, is unlinked somehow to, um, uh, to the repository but it's all inside GitLab. These are comments in the merge request that correspond to this particular branch. And I wanted to do something like look into the collaborations that we did uh, uh, in, uh, with these two aspects. So in this force uh, layout, what you can see is that uh, there are developers, the blue ones are the code loungers, and the close they are, the more they collaborated both in, in terms of, uh, um, uh, for example, code reviews or um, in terms of, of working on the same branch. In this case, for example, these two developers worked on 323 instances, so either features or, uh, yeah, essentially in 323 merge requests, either pushing on the same branch or collaborating together. And uh, what you can see is that at least these two have collaborated a lot. But pretty much uh, uh, the other ones, even if they are far, they are kind of uh, the number of collaborations there, they are um, significant. Uh, if you want, it's just the difference that you can see is just uh, the difference on seniority, on the difference on the, the roles. So the people that maybe don't review together sorry, don't review a lot, so they seem to be collaborating a little less. So the interesting part is that all the others are, for example, the students that we worked with, and if we get out the collaborations of the code loungers, obviously what you get is that we, we have uh, islands that are alone. Okay, I'm a little out of time, but I want to show you this other view, which is interesting. These are the collaborations that happened during our history from 2019, actually. And these are all the events that pertain only to collaborations. The interesting part here is uh, what you can see in this part of the timeline. We had a very significant uh, project uh, that was going over a deadline. Mm -hmm. And so here you can see a lot of activities that were really collaborative. The interesting part is that we had only one project uh, and uh, this was my Uzi. The other th interesting things that I can see here is, for example, the fact that uh, from the end of March, uh, so the start of the pandemic, our way of working significantly changed. And as you can see, uh, we started collaborating more intensively I'm not sure what happened in October. Uh, they're just the, the amounts are a little less. We worked a little more in isolation, but then from this year, we restarted with a little more discipline, if you want, in the way we collaborated. So this I found it kind of interesting in the analysis of the data that I had uh, with Code Launch. Okay, so um, this was for pair programming and code review. I wanted to finish with uh, CI/CD, so continuous integration, continuous development. But given the time, I'm going to cut it a little uh, just to tell you a couple of interesting things. So continuous integration is the, um, uh, the, the um, practice for which you frequently integrate the code that, that you develop. So you continuously check that it builds, that the tests pass, and you build out an artifact. So this is integrated in GitLab, and uh, I want to show you just uh, a little uh, statistics on what we have. 
I measure the amount of uh, time that GitLab spent on building our software, deploying it and doing it uh, essentially for all these tasks from uh, the end of 2017. And it's essentially 61 straight days of develop of uh, of working time, and uh, I don't know if it's uh, a lot or not, but um, this is just the, the time that I that I that I uh, extracted. So, um, from the stages point of view, what you can see is that most of them are either building or testing. But kind of working on uh, on this new part, which is the part on deployment, mm -hmm. and in particular, what we are working recently is an automatic deployment. Automatic deployment essentially works like this: after you have uh, after your software integrates correctly, you release a working version with some technologies, and you automatically deploy to the deployment mach machine without human intervention. So this sounds easy, but it's actually something that in practice, it's uh, uh, subject to a lot of uh, economical and technical constraints. So at a certain moment, this was something that we needed, and we started like investigating how to do this. Mm -hmm. And in particular, what we do at the stage, we are almost there, we can create automatically uh, deployments, so version of our software that can be, for example, reviewed, uh, because they correspond to the modification for a given feature, they can be, or they can be, for example, the production version that uh, our client can use. And uh, again, this sounds easy, but this is part of an effort that took a lot. This is mainly from uh, Jesper, David, Valerie, and Luca that kind of uh, uh, sparked this this effort. And this is uh, one of the last things that we started to. Uh, uh, to add into our um, our development culture, and uh, after something that was the first real in instance of revisiting the things that we do, mm, uh, because this wasn't really working. This was something that we really needed when we started having some clients that uh, needed somehow to uh, look at the things that we did kind of in a continuous way or very frequent way. Uh, most of all, to support code review. So the review deployments serve to actually look at the software that we produce from the uh, uh, user point of view. And in fact, this is probably one even more important than the interaction with the client, if you want to have my personal opinion. This is something that uh, it was an initiative that we sparked a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, in with meetings uh, a couple of actually weeks ago, uh, probably two or three months, I think. And uh, it's taking a lot of time, but it's really, really changing uh, the way we are documenting and uh, performing uh, our uh, development culture itself. And this is just one of the aspects. There are others like quality uh, that I don't have time to uh, to discuss and uh, and for example, uh, the technologies that are also something that uh, uh, unfortunately didn't fit here. So to conclude, I kind of wanted to discuss uh, uh, the way we developed uh, from uh, the practices in the process. And I started with uh, uh, discussing a little, just uh, telling you what is code launch, uh, what are the problems with the mobile and the modern agile uh, techniques, uh, then I told you a little story about uh, how we support planning with one single platform, uh, how we collaborate a little, and how we do continuous integration and deployment in when it was a little cut. And finally, uh, the last part was like uh, just uh, an idea that uh, really taking these ideas and making it into practice and this practice uh, in a way that can be easily reproduced and reapplied to, every, to our, proje our projects in every new project in a way that doesn't allow you to reinvent the wheel every time. It's something that it's taking quite some time. Uh, for you, um, what I could say is that if you're interested in one of these practices, you want to apply that uh, and you want to know how to uh, get support, for example, inside GitLab or in some other 
platforms, development platforms, feel free to interact with us because uh, this is something that uh, that we really like to do. Or uh, if you already do that, uh, especially in GitLab, and you want to see uh, analysis like the one that I showed you, please get in contact with me because I would really like to rerun, in particular, the collaboration graph and see what uh, what we can get from, uh, for example, the way you work. Anyway, thank you very much. This is everything.